Hello and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective, and today we're looking at chapters 40, 41, 42 and 43 of The Da Vinci Code. Where we left off, Robert and Soph were on the run, and they were going through the Bois de Boulogne, which is this park full of prostitutes. I did look up this park, because I was like, is it really a known haunt for sex workers? Like, is it really? Is it really this huge giant park lined with sex workers showing off their wares? And I went on the Wikipedia and it's like, oh, there's a a chateau in the middle of the park that Princess Diana used to visit all the time. Oh, there's also like the courts where they play tennis and like the Olympics were here. And I'm like, okay, so it's not just this random sketchy little park. It's, It's an establishment filled with reputable properties. But then right at the end of the Wikipedia page, it does say there's a little bit of prostitution here and there, you know? I mean, what are you going to (laughs) do? But I don't think it was at the level that Dan Brown was describing. But anyway, so they're escaping the Bois de Boulogne because Fash put out an Interpol thing. So they had to kick the taxi driver out of the car. Luckily, Soph had a gun. But Langdon, he's like, I don't drive stick. (gasps) Cliffhanger. And he just can't drive. He can't drive a stick. And it's just the biggest fucking issue. And so we start chapter 40 with Langdon struggling with the gear shift. And then it says he managed to maneuver the hijacked taxi to the far side of the Bois de Ballon while stalling only twice. (laughs) Only twice. That's a lot. (laughs) When you're like escaping from the police, from the DCPJ, to stall twice is a lot. I wouldn't put only before that. And the taxi dispatcher, he's like on the radio being like, what's going on? What's going on? And Sophie's like, ignore it. We've got to drive. So you'd think this taxi dispatcher who isn't getting a response from one of their drivers, you'd think they'd maybe flag that with Interpol and then they could just track that taxi. uh, Are the taxis tracked? Is there a GPS system, a GPS tracking dot on a bar of soap in that car? Because surely the police are going to find them pretty soon. But Sophie's like, drive, drive, as if they can outrun that situation. I'm not sure how that's going to happen. Also, the taxi driver's probably going to say to one of these prostitutes, being like, oh, hey, um, can I borrow your phone? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, sure. And then he'll just ring up the police and be like, hey, guess what? Those fugitives you're looking for just took over my cab. And I know where they were going. They were going to the Rue Haxo, just just so you know. So they should definitely be caught by now. But but let's see. So then they do a little switcheroo and Sophie starts to drive and she had the car humming smoothly westward, leaving the garden of earthly delights behind. Langdon says it like it's a huge, big achievement. Like, oh, she, she tamed the wild beast. You, you know what? She just drove it. Not that big of a deal. So Sophie starts heading towards the Rue Haxo. She doesn't really know where it is, but she's got an idea of the vicinity. And Langdon, he's looking at the key and he's like ruminating on the key. He doesn't want to go back to what he was just about to tell Sophie, the big reveal about the Holy Grail theory. He doesn't ever circle back to that. He's just sitting in silence thinking about the Priory and the Knights Templar and blah, blah, fucking blah. And then he does think about the Holy Grail. He doesn't, he doesn't tell Sophie. He doesn't finish his sentence, but he does continue to think about the Holy Grail. And he notes that the Grail was believed to be somewhere in England buried in a hidden chamber beneath one of the many Templar churches where it had been hidden since at least 1500. Yeah, you told us two chapters ago, like we got it. I seriously thought we got the full rundown, but we're getting it again. So the Priory, in order to keep their powerful documents safe, had been forced to move them many times. We know. The last Grail sighting had been in 1447, when numerous eyewitnesses described a fire that had broken out and almost engulfed the documents (laughs) before they were carried to safety in four huge chests that each required six men to carry. Oh, okay, so there, there are a lot of documents. Remember last week I was picturing, well, after some Googling, I was picturing just like a sheaf of papyrus, but now we've got four gigantic chests. What documents are they holding? And Langdon says all that remained were whisperings that it was hidden in Great Britain, the land of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Well, you, you also told us just two chapters ago that you were like, oh, it, it went on this ship. To London. Like, what do you mean whisperings? Like, (laughs) you seem to have had all the details previously, but but now he doesn't. And um, so that all happened under Da Vinci's tenure as the Scion Center show. uh, Who who knows? It was in the time of Da Vinci. And that's why Grail enthusiasts poured over Da Vinci's art and diaries in the hopes of unearthing a hidden clue to the Grail's current location. 
kind of convenient that the Grail's current location is still the location that Da Vinci knew of. No one's moved it in 500 years. Prior to that, it was moving around, you know, every decade, but now, but now it's just stayed put. Langdon says <laughs> that Grail aficionados still discussed theories about Da Vinci's work ad nauseum on internet bulletin boards and World Wide Web chat rooms. <laughs> Internet bulletin boards and World Wide Web chat rooms. Does he know that the internet and the World Wide Web are the same thing? Uh, uh, okay. well, World Wide Web. What a flashback. When's the last time you've ever heard of anyone say World Wide Web instead of just WWW, if they have to? If they ever have to allude to a URL, like, no, no one ever says that. And so then he's just going on about all the conspiracies to do with Da Vinci's work. Most recently, Unclear how recent that is because he doesn't tell us, but most recently, the adoration of the Magi was on some sort of New York Times magazine talking about it's a cover up. The painting wasn't actually Da Vinci's, he sketched it and someone else filled it in and and removed a clue. They painted over what Da Vinci originally intended. None of this matters, by the way, Uh, but apparently embarrassed officials at Florence's Uffizi Gallery immediately banished the painting to a warehouse when they figured out that it was a sham. Again, none of this matters. This particular painting is of no importance to the plot. And yet we just got like a 13 line paragraph about it. 13 lines. In the bizarre underworld of modern grail seekers, Leonardo da Vinci remained the quest's great enigma. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Sure. So then Sophie, she's like, well, I'm going to make conversation then. You're sitting there ruminating in silence. You're not going to continue your thought. Well, I'm going to ask you. So she says, is it possible that the key you're holding unlocks the hiding place of the Holy Grail? And he's like, um, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) He's like gaslighting her now, being like, that's fucking crazy. He laughs and he says, oh, I really don't think so. He says, I can't imagine. He says, besides, the grail is believed to be hidden in the UK somewhere, not France. He's like, oh my God, this fucking idiot. Oh, she believes in the Holy Grail. What an idiot. So then he gives her the backstory on how it moved to the UK in the 1500s under the reign of Leonardo da Vinci. And Sophie, meanwhile, she is fully on board. She goes, oh, but the grail seems the only rational conclusion. (laughs) It's the only rational conclusion to what this key might lead us to. Like, okay, well... Maybe have another brainstorm session and think of something else because is it really the most rational of conclusions? Really? Is it really? She says, we have an extremely secure key stamped with the Priory of Scion's seal. It's just the letters PS, isn't it? Like that could be anything. Delivered to us by a member of the Priory of Scion. Like Again, just just because you saw him having sex doesn't mean that he's a confirmed member of the Priory of Scion. And she says, and they're a brotherhood who are the guardians of the Holy Grail. Like, it all adds up. <laughs> it all adds up. And Langdon gaslighting her again. He's, he's like, oh, I know that your contention is logical, but <laughs> I, just, I just cannot accept it. No historical evidence ever suggested that the Grail has moved from the UK back to France. Like, no. I mean, maybe someone actually kept a secret for once. Maybe they did move it secretly. And so you don't know about it, Robert. But he's also thinking like, uh, 24 Rue Haxo doesn't seem like a, a noble final resting place. Maybe that's why it's been kept secret for so long because they didn't just bury it under a temple or somewhere obvious like that. He says, Sophie, I really don't see how this key could have anything to do with the grail. Then why have you been talking about the Holy Grail for like 800 minutes? Sophie, please, no more of your silly little games your little fairy tales. No, Sophie, get with it, get real. It's got nothing to do with the Saint Grial. He says, Sophie, the location of the Holy Grail is one of the best kept secrets in history. Priory members wait decades proving themselves trustworthy before being elevated to the highest echelons of the fraternity and learning where the Grail is. How does he know this? That secret is protected by an intricate system of compartmentalized knowledge, which I ca- apparently he has access to. He interviewed one of the Priory and they just told him everything. He says, although the Priory Brotherhood is very large, only four members at any given time know where the Grail is hidden. The Grandmaster and his three center show. Oh, by the way, I got that wrong last week. I think I thought there was a Grandmaster and then four center show. Well, no, just three. But then Langdon says, the probability of your grandfather being one of those top four people is very slim. 
Like this negative Nelly, where did he come from? But Sophie, she's convinced. She goes, oh, my grandfather was one of them, she thinks. And she thinks that because the image that is stamped in her memory confirmed her grandfather's status within the brotherhood beyond any doubt. So she's thinking back to that orgy that she witnessed and she's like, no, that man who was plowing that woman in that mask, he was definitely the top of the priory. That's the only way to explain why he was getting railed in that basement. And then Langdon says, he's still going, Gaslighty McGee. He goes, and even if your grandfather were in the upper echelon, he would never be allowed to reveal anything to anyone outside the brotherhood. It is inconceivable that he would bring you into the inner circle. I'd slap him in the fucking face. Also, he was dying. (laughs) He'd just been shot. And like, he he knew he had precisely three and a half minutes to die or something. (laughs) Still don't know how he had that knowledge, but he knew he was going to die. So I don't think he like elected to have it revealed to Sophie this way. And yet he was dying in a locked room. So we made do. But Sophie, she, she's not thinking on that path. She's thinking, oh, but I've already been to the inner circle. And she pictures the ritual in the basement. She's like, oh, I've, I've already been in the inner circle. They were, they were written like rabbits. And she wondered if this were the moment to tell Langdon what she had witnessed that night, that, oh, that horrible night in Normandy. For 10 years now, simple shame had kept her from telling a soul. And then just thinking about it, she shuddered. Mate. Yeah, granddad put his dick in someone. Like, that's it. She is so traumatized. Okay, yeah, to see your granddad dicking someone down, like, yeah, maybe you would need a fair bit of therapy after that. Sure, I can't imagine it would have been pleasant. But also, you gotta get over it, Soph. So then they find the Ruhaxo, and Langdon is scanning the horizon of the street looking for a church. And then he's like, wait a minute a forgotten Templar church in this neighborhood. I'm being crazy. I'm being swept up into it. And so then Sophie finds number 24 and she goes, there it is. And Langdon's eyes followed to the structure ahead. Like what a scavenger hunt to find a building on a street. 24 Ruhaxo. You'd think they were in a fucking labyrinth the way they were carrying on about scanning for the building. There it is. What? It's right there. Yeah. Yeah. It's right next to number 22 and number 26. And Langdon's looking at the building and he thinks, what in the world? The building was modern. <laughs> I, uh, uh, mm-hmm. A squat citadel with a giant neon equal armed cross emblazoned atop its facade. Beneath the cross were the words, Depository Bank of Zurich. And Langdon's like, oh, okay, so it's not a church, it's a bank. Crazy. And Langdon's like, oh yeah, I forgot that the equal armed cross had also been adopted as the symbol for the flag of Switzerland. He's like, oh yeah. I probably should have seen that coming. I'd forgotten about the symbol, even though I'm a symbologist. And he goes, oh, well, that's that mystery solved. Because we were all hanging on that mystery of why there was a cross on the prior of Sion Key. Oh, oh, we were hanging on that one. And just so the point is really hammered home, Dan Brown says, Sophie and Langdon were holding the key to a Swiss bank deposit box. End of chapter. So then at chapter 44, we're picking back up with Bishop Arangorosa Remember, he just hopped off the plane at LAX and he's going to the Vatican astronomy tower and he is not a fan of astronomy, hates it. So he's stepping out of the car. Oh, why did I say it like I was from Boston? <laughs> what the, f- parked a car in Harvard, yeah. So he's stepping out of the car and he's cold because there's a chill in the air and he's looking up at the castle. It's dark. It must be late at night. I guess it's late at night because it's like 3 a.m. for Robert and Sophie, so it must, it must be the same for him. But there's like some lights left on at the library at the top of the building. And he's like, oh, they're awake and they're waiting for me. So he goes in, um, a priest greets him at the door. I thought a priest had just greeted him at the car, but now another one's greeting him at the door. And they say, we were worried about you, Bishop. And he's checking his watch. Aaron Garosa, he makes a good point. He goes, yeah, my apologies, but airlines are unreliable these days. I'm like, yeah, he was on a plane. And then you sent a town car, a car, to pick him up. So don't be acting like he's late. That's rude. So they go up to this library. It's all very ornate because the building used to be a palace. And so someone from across the room says, welcome, Bishop. And Aaron Garros is like squinting and being like, who said that? Because the lights are so low. And he, he's met them before, but he doesn't remember their voice. But he's like, who the fuck's talking? What's going on? So he enters the room and then he finally sees three shapes at the table. So there's three men at a long table 
The silhouette of the man in the middle was immediately recognisable because he was obese. <laughs> he was the obese Secretariat Vaticana, overlord of all legal matters within Vatican City. And the other two were just some high ranking cardinals. How funny to be instantly recognisable just because you're obese. I would be demoralised if I was that Secretariat Vaticana. If someone said to me, oh, you were instantly recognisable, your obese silhouette clocked it. I'd be, I'd, I'd have my feelings hurt. So then Aaron Garossa, he comes in and goes, my apologies for the hour. We're on different time zones. You must be tired. Also, you, you can't control when you land. You were on a commercial flight. Why you didn't have a private jet, I'm not too sure, but I'm pretty sure you're on a commercial flight, which is crazy. And so then the secretariat says, not at all. His hands folded on his enormous belly. Okay, Dan Brown, dial it back a bit. You're going a bit too ham on how this guy's obese. <laughs> bit ham, calm down. He says, we are grateful you have come so far. The least we can do is be awake to meet you. Can we offer you some coffee or refreshments? I'm bored. Why are we reading about this? Cut the pleasantries. Um, oh, well, actually, and then they do just go into business, but without any context for us. So I actually don't know what they're talking about. Because one of them saying you acted more quickly than we imagined. You still have a month. And he's like, yeah, well, you told me your concerns five months ago. So why should I wait? And they're like, yeah, well, we're pleased with how quick you were. And so then he looks at a large briefcase and he goes, is that what I requested? And they're like, yeah, it is. Although we're a bit concerned with the request. Okay, we, we are not getting filled in on any of this. Very rare for Dan Brown to hold something back, but here we are. Oh, it must be money because one of them's like, you know what? The sum's quite exorbitant. Can't we wire it to you? Like, do, we, do you really need cash? And then Aaron Garossa thinks something like freedom is expensive. So I think this is his little emergency fund for when shit hits the fan. Oh no, it's not cash. It's Vatican bonds. And he wanted the bonds because that's easier than carrying around cash. He says, I could not lift that much cash. So it must be a lot of cash. If he physically can't lift up a briefcase filled with cash, but he's got bonds. And do you know what? I don't really know what bonds are. That slipped me. In all my school and no one ever sat me down and said, here's what a bond is. No, no. The only bonds I know are Pierce Brosnan and Daniel Craig. Excuse my ignorance. And so then one of the cardinals was like, oh, it's a bit awkward because these bonds are traceable directly to the Vatican Bank. Like, we'd rather give you cash. And he's like, nah, all good. But in his head, he's thinking, yeah, sucked in. That's the whole point. He said, we're all in it together now. And Aaron Garossa says, well, it's a perfectly legal transaction. Opus Dei is a prelature of Vatican City. His holiness can disperse monies however he sees fit. No law has been broken here. And the secretariat, the big, the big fat guy. He leans forward in his chair and the chair creaks under the burden. Oh, this is so rude. So rude to the poor secretariat who's being dodgy. And he says, yeah, well, we don't know what you're going to do with these funds. If, if anything does come up that's illegal, maybe dial it back on the old Vatican side, please. And Aragoros is like, well, what I do with the money is none of your concern. What, what are they talking about? Why are they giving him so much money in bonds? And so then Aaron Garossa says, now I imagine you have something for me to sign. And so they push a piece of paper towards him. And Aaron Garossa says, oh, this is identical to the copy you already sent me. And they say, exactly. And he goes, okay. And so he signs it. And I, you know, I'd still give it a little glance. Don't sign something without reading it. Especially when they're like, yeah, it's the exact same as before. Trust us. No. Aaron Garossa, you're being a bit of an idiot. And so he signs it. And the three men seem to sigh in relief, which is another bad sign. And one of them says, thank you, Bishop. Your service to the church will never be forgotten. And so then Aaron Garossa just picks up his briefcase full of bonds and he walks out. He's like, all right, well, laters. Go back to bed. And then one of them says, oh, Bishop, Bishop, while he's walking away. And then he says, where will you go from here? And Aaron Garossa was like, I think, I think he's asking me on like a more spiritual level, but I don't really want to talk to him about morality. So he just goes, Paris. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm going to Paris. How about that? Well, that was a confusing little scene. That's the end of that chapter. We go to chapter 42. We're back at the bank. And okay, now we've got to learn what banking is. Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, we're getting the backstory on banking. Oh my lordy, 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 lordy. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Here we go. The Depository Bank of Zurich was a 24 hour Geldschrank bank offering the full modern array of anonymous services in the tradition of the Swiss numbered account. Okay, you'd think that's all we'd need to know, but no. He continues, maintaining offices in Zurich, Kuala Lumpur, New York, and Paris, the bank had expanded its services in recent years to offer anonymous computer source code escrow services and faceless digitized backup. What? These are just words. This is word salad. And then uh, they, they do blind drop services. 
anonymous safe deposit boxes. Apparently all these art thieves could just deposit their belongings anonymously through a series of high-tech veils of privacy, withdrawing items at any time, also in total anonymity. Great, glad we got that context on what a bank is. Thank you. And so they pull up at the front, and Landon's looking at the building's uncompromising architecture, and sensed the Depository Bank of Zurich was a firm with little sense of humour. What? How many banks have a sense of humour? What the fuck are you talking about? Oh, I can tell from the architecture that this bank doesn't appreciate jokes. Like, it's a bank, Robert. It's a, it's a bank. You're not going to a comedy club, doll. I don't know what you're thinking. Okay, have you got enough backstory on banking? No, you don't. Switzerland's reputation for secrecy in banking had become one of the country's most lucrative exports. Facilities like this had become controversial in the art community. Yeah, because they provide a place for art thieves to hide their stolen goods. You've already told us that. The whole point is, the bank accounts are attached to account numbers rather than people's names, so you can be anonymous. Like, got it, okay. Now she drives up towards the bank's driveway. Oh my, and and he has to tell us what a driveway is. Oh, are you shitting me? Okay, it says, they pulled up to a gate that blocked the bank's driveway. Dash, a cement lined ramp that descended beneath the building. Oh, thank you. Thank you for describing what a driveway is. You've got to be fucking kidding me. And a video camera was aimed directly at them. And Langdon had the feeling that this camera, unlike those at the Louvre, was authentic. Love that call back to how the Louvre doesn't have real cameras. Still think that's bullshit, but you know what? We're going to call back to it. So then they pull up to a little electronic podium on the driver's side. It's basically like a fast food drive through ordering machine. And Sophie sticks the key in. And Langdon says, something tells me it will fit. Um, probably not the first time he's ever said that. And so then Sophie turns the key. It does fit. Oh, lo and behold. And then the gate begins to swing open. And then they go down the driveway, which is, uh, how do I explain it? It's sort of like a cement lined ramp um, that descended beneath the building. And so they go down to the bottom of that driveway, that, that cement ramp. Can you picture it? It's, it's sort of like a cement ramp. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, and then there's another gate with another lock for them to shove the key into. And so she's like, oh, Jesus Christ. So then she puts the key in the lock. She turns it, the gate opens. Don't know why we need two of them. And so then they go further down this ramp, what some would call a driveway. They go further down into the belly of the structure. Now they're in a private garage. And then there's a red carpet on the cement floor leading up to a huge door of solid metal. And Langdon's like, talk about mixed messages. Welcome and keep out. Robert, not everything's a symbol. Oh, he's always looking into things for symbols and messages. Just, uh, just fucking relax and go, go enjoy your banking experience. And Sophie says, you better leave the gun here. And he's like, oh, with pleasure. Like, did he not already think that maybe he should stash the gun? You can't take a gun into a bank, Langdon. So they walk up the red carpet towards the slab of steel. The door had no handle, but it had a triangular keyhole. And he's like, oh, I bet we got to put the key in. And Langdon says, it keeps out the slow learners. Like what? Like it's, it's, it's keyhole Langdon. I'm, no one's getting to this point being like, oh, I can't get in. Like th- they'll put the key in the hole. They've just done it twice. And Sophie's like, oh, all nervous. She's all nervous. And she's like, here we go. And I think she's like wondering if the key won't work, but it's already worked twice. But she's like, oh, here we go. And she turns, oh, oh my God, it opens. Oh my God, the door opens. Oh, how about that? So then they're in the foyer of the bank and Langdon's talking about the decor. He says, where most banks were content with the usual polished marble and granite, this one had opted for wall-to-wall metal and rivets. And he's thinking, who's their decorator? Allied steel? Okay. Langdon, you need to call it with the jokes. No, Dan Brown, you need to call it with the jokes. You got one good joke in with the Harry Potter book being the bestseller instead of the Bible. One good joke. And now it's Quip City. You need to call it. Why are you worrying about the bank's decorator when you're on a hunt for the Holy Grail? It's a... And Sophie's also looking around and she's intimidated by the decor. The message was clear. You are walking into a vault. Y- yeah, you're, you're walking into a bank vault. Like, uh. And so then a large man, another large man, he walked up to them from behind a counter. And he was watching a small TV and he just turns it off. Oh no, he's not obese. He's got enormous muscles and a visible sidearm. And he says, bonsoir, how may I help you? And Langdon's like, ah the dual language greeting, the newest hospitality trick of the European host. Oh, it's the the newest? It's the newest, is it? 
When did speaking two languages start, Robert? When, 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 did that, when did that come into fashion? Oh, it's the trick of the Europeans. Oh, being bilingual. Oh, oh, what a hospitality trick. What a trick to get us to say how we are. Oh, and Sophie doesn't even respond. In either language, she just lays the key on the counter and she's like, uh-huh. And he goes, oh, okay, all right. Um, well, your elevator is at the end of the hall. I'll let someone know that you're coming. And she goes, which floor? And the bellhop guy, he's like, oh, I almost got you there. He goes, um, uh, your key instructs the elevator, which floor? And she's like, oh yeah. And he's like, alarm bells. So he watches them as the two of them go up towards the elevator, insert the key, board the lift and disappear. And then he grabs the phone because he just saw them being wanted fugitives on the TV. And because he's never heard of the phrase snitches get stitches, he calls his manager and says, we have a situation down here. And so the manager goes, okay, well, what's going on? And he says, the French police are tracking two fugitives tonight. And he's like, okay. And he goes, and both of them just walked into our bank. Like, way to bury the lead. That's not how you present information. Why does everybody talk in cliffhangers? It kills me. So the manager's like, all right, well, I'll call the big boss. And so then the guard hangs up and places a second call to Interpol. Rot row. Interpol's going to know where they are. Even though, again, as I said, the taxi driver knows where they're going. Um, and the taxi presumably may or may not have a GPS tracking dot hidden in a bar of soap in the car. Who knows? And Langdon was surprised to feel the elevator dropping rather than climbing. I don't know why that's such a big surprise. Elevators do go both up and down. And he's, he's spooked by that. He's like, what? And also he is afraid of elevators. So we can't wait to get out of there. So when they get out of the elevator, there's already someone there to meet them. Some old guy in a nice suit. And he's like, oh, hey, bonsoir. Bonsoir, good evening. And Langdon's like, oh, you know that trick too. That newest hospitality trick where people speak in multiple languages. <laughs> You're not going to get one on me. I've read all the tricks. I know all the tricks in the book. And so then he leads them to this little room which is like a lavish sitting room in a fine hotel. And there's already an opened bottle of Perrier. It's bubbles still fizzing and a pot of coffee steaming beside it. And Langton's like, oh, just like clockwork, leave it to the Swiss. The way his mind wanders is so bizarre. He will just think the most random things. And it's unclear to me why he's thinking these things. His view of the world is just bizarre. And so then the guy goes, oh, I, I get the feeling that this is your first visit to us. And Sophie nods and he goes, yeah, I get it. You know, keys are often passed on as an inheritance. First time users are invariably uncertain of the protocol. I get it. So he just tells them everything. Doesn't seem like good security, but he's just like, yeah, I get it. Your key is like a Swiss numbered account, which are often willed through generations. He's just giving them all this information. On our gold accounts, the shortest safety deposit box lease is 50 years paid in advance. And Langdon goes, did you, did you say 50 years? Again, wh- why do you care? Did you say 50 years? What a ridiculous time to have a safe deposit box. And then this chatty Cathy host, he's like, yeah, at a minimum. But barring further arrangements, if there's no activity on an account for 50 years, the contents of that safe deposit box are automatically destroyed. And then he says, shall I run you through the process of accessing your box? Has he been trained in how to not be robbed? And he explains that it's a private viewing room. Once he leaves the room, they can stick the key in, open up the box and spend as much time as they want with the box, which arrives on a conveyor belt, like it's a baggage claim. And what happens is once they put the key in, the computer confirms the markings on the key. They have to enter an account number. And then the safe deposit box is retrieved robotically, (laughs) robotically, from the vault below. When you're finished, you put it back on the conveyor belt, put your key in again. Oh, and the process is reversed magically, robotically with the power of computers. I think Dan Brown writing this in 2004 as well was like, you know, I'll just say computer and people will just fill in the blanks. He's like, people will never really know how computers work. So I'll just say it's a computer thing and people just have to go with it. But now reading it, I'm like, I don't know if this is how computers work. I don't think you could just say, oh, the computer does it all and just brush it off that you've got this random conveyor belt system inside of the bank. Uh, Nah, 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 nah. But anyway, this guy's just telling them the whole kit and caboodle. He's explaining how banks work. It's it's wonderful. And then the phone rings, rot roll, and he's like, oh, oh, okay. Um, I gotta go. You guys have fun in the room. Just make yourselves at home. 
And Sophie's like, oh, before you go, can you just tell me what my account number is? Like, what, what's that thing you said about an account number? And he goes, but of course. Like most Swiss banks, our safe deposit boxes are attached to a number, not a name. Oh, here we go again. You have a key and a personal account number known only to you. Yeah, okay. Your key is only half of your identification. Okay, that's been established. Your personal account number is the other half. Okay, well, that was kind of obvious. Otherwise, if you lost your key, anyone could use it. Okay. Exposition dump. He could have just said, oh yeah, that's your account number that you need to put in. Oh, the over-explaining. Fuck me dead. And Sophie says, um, what if like we don't have an account number? And the banker, he's thinking in his head and we get access to his POV momentarily. <laughs> he's thinking, then you obviously have no business here. And then he's like, oh, I'll get someone to help you. They'll be in shortly. Because he's already been told there's two fugitives in there. Get the fuck out. Let's lock them up. And then we cut to the Gare du Nord train terminal, which is just like every other train station in all of Europe. And Colette's getting a call from Fash. And Fash is like, Inabal got a tip, forget the train. You need to get to the Depository Bank of Zurich right now. And Colette thinks it's like a social call. He's like, oh yeah, sure. Um, hey, by the way, while I've got you, like what's been going on with uh, what Saunier was trying to tell Nouveau and Langdon, like anything going on there? Like, what's the tea? Anyone found out anything? And Fash is like, um, go arrest them and then you can ask them. Hurry up, please. And Colette's like, geez, all right, all right, get off my back. And that's the end of that chapter. So chapter 43 opens with André Vernet, who's the president of the Paris branch of the Depository Bank of Zurich. And he lives in a flat above the bank, which I, I love a short commute, but also... <laughs> How, you're in Paris. Do you not want to live somewhere other than 24 Rue Haxo? Like, where do you live? Oh, on top of a bank. Oh, how glamorous. And he's even thinking like, oh, can't wait till I retire and I can get a nice house. I can get a wine cellar. Oh, it'll be so nice. And apparently he'd only been awake for six and a half minutes, but he was already running downstairs to the bank, looking good. He's in an impeccable suit. His hair's all in place. And apparently Vernet modeled his sleep habits after the Maasai warriors, the African tribe famous for their ability to rise from the deepest sleep to a state of total battle readiness in a matter of seconds. Is anyone going to tell him that he's a banker? <laughs> okay. A little bit different from being a warrior in battle to just being a banker. And Vernet's thinking, yeah, you know what? Battle ready. That's a good comparison. Okay, so was he, was he narrating? Was he hearing the narration in his head? Because he's like, battle ready. That's a good way to put it. That's how I feel, knowing that the police are coming when I've got my client that I need to protect. I think he was listening to the narration. I, I don't know, but he's, he's responding to the narrator in agreeance. That's, that's bizarre. Okay, so he's thinking, all right, what I'll do is... I'll get these people out of my bank before the police arrive. I've got about five minutes. Better move quickly, protect the client. He's like, I'll tell the police that they walked in, but because they're not clients and had no account number, they were turned away. So he already knows the T about the account number. And then he's like, oh God, why did that stupid watchman call Interpol? What was he thinking? Discretion was apparently not part of the vocabulary of a 15 euro per hour watchman. Okay, well, maybe pay him more if you want him to commit crimes. You want him to break the law, maybe pay him more than 15 euro per hour. Is that crazy? So then he walks in and he's like, oh, hello, I'm Andre. <laughs> I don't know if he actually talked like that. He was probably being more like, good evening. I am Andre Vernet. How can I be of service? And Sophie, she cuts him off. She's like, ah, ta, 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 ta. She says, do we know each other? Oh, she says that because he had stopped talking because he had a look as if he'd seen a ghost. And he goes, ah, uh, no, um, I don't believe so. Oh, I mean, he says, no, I don't believe so. Our services are anonymous. He says, my assistant tells me you have a gold key, but no account number. Oh, no, he says, <clears throat> my assistant tells me you have a gold key, but no account number. How did you come by this key? And she goes, my grandfather left it to me. He was in an orgy in a basement and it scarred me for life, but he did leave me this key. And he's like, really, bitch? You, you got the key, but not the account number? Like, what? That doesn't add up. And she goes, yeah, he, well, he was actually murdered tonight. So it's, he was on a bit of a time crunch. And he says, Jacques Zunier is dead. Well, <clears throat> he says, Jacques Zunier is dead? But how? 
I don't know if he's French or if he's Swiss or what accent I'm doing. I'm just going to talk in my own normal voice for Monsieur Vernet. So he's like, Jacques Sonnier is dead. What? And Sophie says, what? You knew him? You knew him? And he's like, oh, astounded. And he goes, Jacques and I were dear friends. When did this? Do you reckon they were fucking? (laughs) Maybe they were fucking. Maybe he was down in that basement with them. Jacques and I were dear friends. When did this happen? He says, when did this happen? And she goes, earlier this evening, inside the Louvre. She didn't need to add that. I just think she wanted to heighten the dramatic tension, being like, crazy, right? Yeah, it happened inside the Louvre. I know you didn't ask where it happened, but it happened in the Louvre. How about that? And so then Vinette, who was meant to be in a total state of battle readiness, <laughs> he was like a Maasai warrior six minutes ago, but now he's like crumpled in a chair and he's like, oh, oh no, not Jacques Sunier. He says, did either of you have anything to do with his death? And they're like, nah. And he says, well, guess what? Your pictures are being circulated by Interpol. That's how I recognized you. You're wanted for a murder. Okay, I don't know if he's telling Porky's here. Like, is that the truth? Because his staff already told him that they were wanted fugitives. So I don't think when he opened the door, he was like, oh, oh my God, fugitives. I think he, well, then he, has he already seen their photo? He should have already seen their photo. I don't know why she took his breath away. Surely when he got the six and a half minute wake up call, he checked his phone or got given a photo of Sophie. I don't know, maybe he didn't. Anyway, okay, so he's recognized Sophie, knew all about the fugitive, but didn't know it was Sophie perhaps. I don't know, but he says, you're wanted for murder. And then she's slumping on a chair. They're all slumping. And she goes, oh no, Fash ran an Interpol broadcast already. She's like gooped by that. It's like, uh, yeah, he's doing police work. I mean, he wasn't earlier in the night, but he's finally come around to being a police officer. And it says, it seemed the captain was more motivated than Sophie had anticipated. He was conducting an elaborate ruse in the Louvre, showing the suspect the crime scene and the dead body in order to coax a confession. Like, I think he was already quite invested. And so then Vernet, he's like, so your grandfather left you a key when he was dying? And she's like, yeah, whole big thing. And he's like, you didn't get any account number? He only left you the key, no account number, no slip of paper. And she's like, nah. And she's trying to think back and she's like, you know what? It was just the key. I don't think I saw anything behind Madonna of the Rocks. And Vernet's like, sorry, babes, but every key is electronically paired with, oh, we we know that, is electronically paired with a 10 digit account number that functions as a password. Without the number, your key is worthless. And she's thinking 10 digits. Oh my goodness gracious me. The cryptographic odds were over 10 billion possible choices. She's like, oh no, we're never going to crack it. (laughs) Of course not. But like, maybe think back to when Numbers were involved tonight. She's like, he didn't write down any numbers. Oh, he did not give me any numbers. What are we going to do? What a quandary, what a pickle. And so then they just keep going over being like, oh no, what can we do? And he's like, we can't do anything without the account number. You can't access the box. And she's like, oh no, but he didn't leave me an account number. And he says, what? You didn't have an account number. She goes, just the key. And he says, oh, well, you can't get in with just a key. You need an account number. And she's like, oh no, we didn't have an account number. Just in circles, in circles, in circles. And I'm like, cast your mind back to the dead body with all of the clues written on the floor. Do you not remember any numbers? And she's like, no, I don't remember any numbers. She goes, oh no, what are we going to do? And she goes, Monsieur Vanette, our time is short, so I'm going to be very direct. And so she shows him the key and she says, does this symbol mean anything to you? And he's like, nah, lots of, lots of people have symbols on their keys. Big fucking whoop. And she sighs and she says, this seal is the symbol of a secret society known as the Priory of Sion. Now she's the expert. And Vinette's like, ah, oh, don't know anything about that, doll. He goes, your grandfather was a friend of mine. We mostly spoke business. And she says, Monsieur Vinette, my grandfather called me tonight and said we're in grave danger. He gave me a key to your bank. Now he's dead. Anything you can tell us would be helpful. And he's like, I told you, doll, you need a 10 digit number. And the police are on their way. Like, what more do you want me to do? And she says, look, my grandfather said he needed to tell me the truth about my family. Does that mean anything to you? Maybe you should have called him back. (laughs) I'm sorry, you spent 10 years ignoring the poor bastard. And now she's asking all his friends for answers. See, Monsieur Vonette, he probably knows the tea. He knows the backstory about how you're such a fucking prude. And you cut out your granddad, your only living relative, just because he was getting his dick wet in the basement. He says, Mademoiselle, your family died in a car accident when you were young. I'm sorry. I know your grandfather loved you very much. He mentioned to me several times how much it pained him that you two had fallen out of touch. 
Okay, they're semen close. I think they're bosom pals. Because he's he, he knows a lot of the tea. And then Langdon's like, look, do the contents of this box have anything to do with the sangreal? I was like, okay, mate. Why, why are you saying sangria? Just say holy grail. Like, uh, why? The police are on their way. They're like in the building. And he's like, the sangreal, French for sang, meaning blood. It's been shortened to sangreal, which translates to holy grail. Do you know anything about it? Like, oh, fuck, cut, cut to the chase. And Vernet's like, I don't know what sangreal is. And that's when his phone rings. And someone, one of his workers says like, oh, they're here. (laughs) They'll be in the lobby in a minute. And he's like, ah, shit. And he says, look, they're arriving as we speak, guys. And so listen to this. Sophie had no intention of leaving empty handed. Tell them we came and went already. If they want to search the bank, demand a search warrant. That will take them time. Like, do you forget that you're the fugitive? You're making demands of this guy, even though you're clearly not a customer. He was friends with your granddad, who you were a little shit to. Like, that's the only play you have. And you're being so stroppy. So demanding. Tell the police to go away. Like, okay, no, doll. Like, you don't get to make those demands. But you know what? It works. (laughs) As dumb as it is, it works. And he goes, listen, Jacques was a friend and my bank doesn't need this kind of press. So yeah, for those two reasons, I will not be allowing an arrest to be made on this premises. So let me smuggle you out of the bank. How does harboring fugitives, helping them avoid arrest, how does that turn into better publicity for the bank than just an arrest happening on the premises? And he says, all right, stay here. I'll make arrangements and then I'll be right back and I'll help you guys escape. And Sophie's like, oh, but the safe deposit box, like we can't just leave. Like, could you get that for us? And he's like, mate, I've told you, my little friend told you repeatedly, you need an account number. You need an account number with the key. You see, because the key is only half. The key is only half of the account details. Only with the password will the key be activated. And the password is an account number. So once you've got the account number, that will activate the key. See, you can't have one or the other. You need both of them as a whole in order to unlock the safety deposit box. And like, finally she's like, oh yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, I do remember you saying something about that. Yeah, sorry. And then she thinks maybe the account number was buried in one of the countless letters and packages her grandfather had sent over the years and which she had left unopened. Probably not. You're casting your mind that far back for an account number. (sighs) Jesus Christ, Jesus fucking Christ. And then Robert finally has a brainwave. He's like, oh, oh. And she goes, Robert, you're smiling. And he says, your grandfather was a genius. And she's like, okay, um... What have you figured out? Just tell me. And he goes, 10 digits, hey. And she had no idea what he was talking about. She still hasn't figured it out. And he's like, huh? Your grandfather, 10 digits? And she's like, mate, I'm not on your level. Like, can you just tell me what you're thinking? And he says, the account number. I'm pretty sure he left it for us after all. And a little grin is on his face. He is so fucking smug. And she's like, okay, where? And then he pulls out the photo of the crime scene. Oh, and of course, oh, and of course, there was a number on that floor all this time. How could we forget? It's the randomized Fibonacci sequence. 13, 3, 2, 21, 1, 1, 8, 5, 10 digits. Oh, they've cracked the Da Vinci Code. How fucking stupid are the pair of them? I swear to God. So that's the end of the chapter. Next week, it looks like we're, we're escaping from a bank. It's a heist, baby. I'll see you guys then. Bye. Send your burning thoughts, frustrations, and grievances on this latest chapter of this shitty book to breakingdownpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at podbreakingdown and Instagram at breakingdownbadbooks. You can visit www.breakingdownbadbooks.com for all the listen links, contact information, merch, and more. To support the show on Patreon and gain access to exclusive ad-free bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash breakingdownbadbooks. Ratings and reviews on your preferred podcast platform are also a fun, free way to support the show. Breaking Down Bad Books is hosted by me, Nathan Brown, who you can follow on Instagram and Twitter at NathanBrown90. Thanks for listening and happy reading.